Good evening. I'm Jennifer Rabb, and I have the enormous privilege of serving as the president of Hunter College, where online or on campus, where I am so happy to be tonight, the American dream continues to come true. Thank you for joining us tonight for the fifth installment of our online series entitled Speaking of Justice, Race, Racism, and Reform. This programming was launched four weeks ago, not only to explore the historical and political roots of systemic racism, but to address its impact on everyday American life and hopefully to find ways to eliminate it from our society. I want to thank our Hunter team, Hunter's Dean of Diversity, John Rose, Misha Smith, Malky Schwartz, and Roosevelt House Director, Harold Hoser, for helping to produce this series. I thank also the amazing participants of our first four programs. Just last week, an extraordinary gathering of proud Hunter alumni shared their unique perspectives on how they turned their Hunter education into careers fighting for social justice and racial equality. They frankly discussed the challenges they faced as women of color along the way to becoming professional change makers. A week earlier, expert panelists tackled the topic of healthcare access and entrenched disparities that have been laid bare during the COVID-19 pandemic. In the two weeks before that, we engaged in powerful discussions on the fraught topics of monuments and symbols, as well as on the history of, and future of protest movements. Indeed, this is a time of national momentum. At Hunter, we are seizing the opportunity by developing specific new initiatives to foster a more inclusive learning and working environment. A presidential task force will enact strategies to enhance and enrich the curriculum and new counseling services that will support students navigating these challenging times. And a faculty chosen book addressing the impact of racism will be assigned to all incoming students this year to help generate communal inspiration to make Hunter more inclusive and welcoming than ever before. It is our belief that dialogues like this can help generate a better, more equitable tomorrow for our state, our city, and our campus. And in doing so, they also help us to fulfill our historic commitment to the Hunter College motto, Nihi Kura Futuri, the care of the future is mine. Tonight's conversation promises to deliver important insights on how to truly live up to our ideals of diversity and inclusion by focusing on a pervasive social dynamic that threatens to undermine them. It's a topic that came up during our post-panel discussion groups in previous programs, and we are now pleased to give it the full attention that it requires in a discussion entitled Code Switching, Style, Expression, or Survival. For many in our community and beyond, code switching is an unspoken reality and a matter of everyday existence, impacting aspects of life from the social to the professional. It is the pressure to accommodate the prejudice that exists towards one's race, ethnicity, social class, or religion by addressing how you speak, dress, or even how you choose to do your hair or your, choose your favorite music. It is the expectation forced on so many to conceal their culture and to conform. It is a name for a social tactic that no one should ever have to use in our society, although many are forced to function in environments that simply do not accept them as they truly are. There is no better place to host this conversation than at Hunter College, an institution with a historic commitment to diversity. To lead this important discussion, we are pleased to welcome back Hunter College's own Karen Hunter, distinguished lecturer in the Department of Film and Media and the host of Sirius XM's radio program, The Karen Hunter Show, which has helped to advance the discussion of code switching and so many other topics intrinsic to racial inequity. Karen is also a best-selling author and a journalist whose honors include a Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing. In June 2015, Karen authored a petition for the removal of the Confederate flag from the State House of South Carolina in the wake of the massacre of nine people at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Within three days, more than 500,000 people had signed that petition. Within a week, 
Governor Nikki Haley vowed to take down the flag, and within two weeks, that flag was removed. This is just one example of the power and reach of the Karen Hunter Show. As Karen often says, the Karen Hunter Show is not a talk show, it's an action show. Karen, thank you for your dedication to Hunter College, for bringing us your thought-provoking and cutting-edge programming, for inspiring our students in and out of the classroom, and even recently giving a group of our students an insider look at your radio show. Joining Karen tonight is the extraordinary Hunter alumna, Joy Nuga, from the class of 2017. At Hunter, Joy was a Macaulay Honors student who majored in economics, minored in German and international relations, and earned a certificate in public policy from Roosevelt House while serving as the student vice chair of the Hunter College Senate. After graduating, Joy was hired as a senior risk analyst at Goldman Sachs, and then she was awarded the prestigious Schwartzman Scholarship, one of the world's leading programs for graduate study abroad to pursue graduate work at Tsinghua University in Beijing. This spring, Joy graduated with her Master's of Management Science with a concentration in global affairs and business and economics. I have had the great privilege to watch Joy grow from being a student activist to a seasoned professional, and I am so personally proud of her success. As the daughter of immigrant parents from Nigeria, born and raised in the South Bronx, and with global experience across a range of cultures, Joy speaks to us tonight from a uniquely informed vantage point on tonight's topic. We are pleased as well to introduce lifestyle writer, media coach, best-selling author, magazine editor, nationally syndicated advice columnist, and all-around Renaissance woman and longtime hunter friend, Harriet Cole. Harriet is the author of seven books, including The Essential, How to Be. As a media coach, she has provided services to world-renowned entertainers, including Mary J. Blige and Alicia Keys, as well as business professionals and entrepreneurs. Her extensive magazine experience includes more than 11 years at Essence, Essence Magazine, where she held positions including fashion director and lifestyle editor. She has also served as creative director and editor-in-chief of Ebony Magazine and produced groundbreaking covers and features on icons like President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. In 2016, Harriet launched an educational initiative called Dream Leapers, offering everything from inspirational talks and professional networking to retreats where participants can hone their business ideas and learn to build their brand. We are so pleased that hundreds of Hunter students have benefited from Harriet's coaching and mentorship as part of this program. Through decades of work across a range of mediums, Harriet has created her own unique path at the intersection of African American culture across television, radio, and books. There could be no better example of a successful professional who inspires people to be their best, most authentic selves than Harriet. Thank you so much for joining us, Harriet, and being part of the Hunter family. And now, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. It is a pleasure to turn tonight's program over to our moderator, Professor Karen Hunter. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, President Rob. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for all of the people who are joining us tonight. Uh, this conversation, as you mentioned, came out of one of our previous conferences, and it was interesting. It came about organically as we were having a conversation about the future, and there were several students and faculty members in this breakout session. And the question was, how do you show up in the workplace, and how do you show up in the world. And if you're Black in America, do you have to shape shift in order to be accepted? And in that shape shifting, does that spell success? So we're having this conversation today. It's part of the Speaking of Justice uh, series, code switching style, expression, or survival. And let me welcome again, because President Rob did such a great job in introducing Joy Nuga. And of course, Harry Cole, welcome. Hi. Hey, hey Hi. ladies. <laughs> All right. Listen, um, and, and this is a conversation I've been having ongoing since college. And so I want to start with Joy, who just graduated a few years ago and already has probably a career that I'm envying right now. It's amazing. When you were younger, 
when you were coming up, what did your parents tell you about how to comport yourself? Because it's code switching might seem like everyone has to do it, right? It's, it's, you know, how you show up in the world and there are certain rules for the workplace, certain rules for the, your, your friends, certain rules in your home. We all have rules that we live by. But for you, what was told to you about how to show up? Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, I wish my parents um, had the word or the term for it, specifically code switching, because to me and my older sister and my younger brother, it was just, oh, our parents are not letting us sound like all our friends that we went to school with, um, given that I went to school in the South Bronx with students who were predominantly Puerto Rican, Dominican, Afro-Caribbean, Caribbean, et cetera. And so, you know, at home, um, we were very much expected to speak in very proper English because my parents were very adamant about the fact that they wouldn't want us to be turned down from any opportunity in the future because of where we come from, because of our long names. I know you see Joy Nuga, but my full name is actually 49 letters long. So just a lot of- Just you say, know, say it for us, say it for us, Joy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Joy, Olola de Omo Shaliwa, Anu Olua Mipo, Olua Tukumbo Nuga. And they all have very, um, you know, strong meanings in our culture and my language, which is Yoruba. But my parents were very adamant about the fact that, you know, in the country that they had only immigrated to perhaps four or five years prior to the time that we were going to school, they had already seen, you know, prejudice because they had a stronger accent. And so growing up, they were very strict about us speaking proper English and not trying to pick up the accent that, you know, naturally you would pick up if you're a child of immigrants. So that was one reality. And then I would go to school um, in a school that was actually on the Grand Concourse, not too far from Yankee Stadium. And everyone speaking like typical Bronx, Bronx slang. And it's like, I wanted to partake in that. And so very quickly at age, what, seven, eight, I was already code switching. And it didn't occur to me that that's what I was doing until I learned about it formally in college. And then I faced the more stark reality when I began my career um, in finance. We're going to dig into what that reality is and how we navigate th that fork in the road that we all come to. Uh, and this is, a, a, again, a, the perfect forum to have this conversation. I see you shaking your head. Ms. Cole, how to be. You wrote a whole book on how to be. I, you are I a queen did. of etiquette. Talk about what was going on in your household. Well, what's interesting is to hear that Joy, who is much younger than I, had an almost identical experience, which just shows how strong these understandings are and beliefs are from our families about how to get ahead especially if you're black. And, I, and, and I'm married to a Jamaican man who grew up in Jamaica and moved to New York when he was 14. So I wanna address that for a moment. When he first went to school in junior high school, he said that he was teased so badly by students that he learned how to speak American English. And because he, he, he they would, he, how, what'd you say? Could you say that again? And he, he didn't want that to be his experience. And so you, when I first heard him speak uh, Jamaican Patois, we were in a bodega. I was like, you can speak Jamaican. He's like, what? I am Jamaican. And he was so offended. But I had never, I mean, I'd been with him for a while and had never heard him speak with a Jamaican accent. And I want to address that code switching, you know, which in case there's somebody listening who doesn't understand, it is you know, assigning yourself the ability to communicate to people the way that is comfortable for them in a given situation. So you kind of switch from whatever might be your norm in a particular environment to what would be theirs. As it relates to accents, there are a few accents that are beloved in this culture. And, and they would be French and British, right. not French West African, French and British, and maybe Spanish if it's from Spain, but not Spanish if it's from the West Indies. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some, some of it, you know, Australian a little bit too. So there, I mean, it's so ingrained in, in our culture, what is considered acceptable and desirable and what is not. So, so now I'll just say how I grew up. I'm from Baltimore. Uh, my father was a tall, dark-skinned man. He became 
a judge. He was the first black judge on the Maryland Court of Appeals. An amazing career. A judge, he became a lawyer at a time when hardly any black people were even going to law school. How did we grow up? I'm one of three girls. I could not wear my hair like this. When I started wearing my hair, hair curly when I was in college and I came home, I will never forget, my father handed me a comb. I was going to sit down at the table to eat. And he handed me a comb, said, here, I, I have a comb for you. Go comb your hair before you sit down at the table. He was very strict. Now, I was mad at him for years, but I teach etiquette. What? I learned what all he wanted was for me to have an advantage. And he said, if you do not do your hair in a way so that people will take you seriously, you are putting yourself at an unnecessary disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And that this was the belief. You know, if you were brown, you better figure out how you can be in the flow and not be offensive to other people by your appearance. And yeah, and, and for me, just to fin finish this little piece of the point, I, I now teach a hybrid. You know, I've learned from my parents, there's a lot more freedom that I have experienced than they. Uh, but I, I will say I err on the side of conservative with, with curls. <laughs> Which are now accepted, right? Exactly. So, so the world is caught up. But, you know, yeah, as you're talking, Harriet, and as you're talking, Joy, um, you know, there are people listening who are immigrants, who are raised in immigrant homes, who say, well, this is the same thing that I've been told, you know? And so what's the difference? There is a distinction in this, and, and I think, Harriet, you touched on it. There are certain acceptable accents. Mm -hmm. There are certain acceptable ways to be. There are acceptable complexions when we talk about race. And when you show up in, in a corporate environment or in a, in a workplace, you need to blend in in order to get ahead. And at least that's the assumption, right? Right. Because that was a conversation we were having a few weeks ago. The assumption is the closer I am to making people comfortable, the easier my path will be to success, right? But in the process, and this is the question that I've always had my entire life, because for some reason, I'm a contrarian. If me showing up as my full self makes you uncomfortable, but it means that I'm not giving you everything that I can, is that success? If, if I can't show up and be as talented because I'm worried about my hair and my diction and my, and my dulcet tones and, and, and how I, you know, oh, two or more of us at a water cooler, let's disperse because we don't want to make people uncomfortable. Are we really building an environment for, for all of us to succeed? And what is corporate America losing when we can't show up as our full self? So those are the questions that are on the table that people are gonna have to process. But you know, as we pull through this, I wanna play a clip because this is germane to black people. Code switching, everyone does it. But when your phenotype is always making people uncomfortable. And I, and I think about, uh, there was a law actually a literal law passed 1786 in Louisiana that black women could not wear their natural hair out because it was disrupting the men. Men were distracted by their hair. So they passed a law, 1786, the T in law that forced black women to cover their hair. You could not show up in public free or enslaved with your hair out. And then of course, because black women are creative, the hair wraps became distracting. Yeah because we're going to be like, okay, let's figure out how to make this really sexy. Booker T. Washington believed that Black people just dressed well and spoke well, that somehow racism would go away, that white people realize that we're not savages, and then they would love us. He was wrong. So code switching for us is, is it survival? Let's play this clip. And this is from How to Get Away with Murder, the last season, which uh, Viola Davis, who you're seeing right now, she, from day one, from taking off the makeup, there's so many scenes throughout the six seasons of How to Get Away with Murder as a Black woman, for this strong Black woman to have to constantly look at herself and figure out, am I okay? Am I okay? So this was the season finale. Season uh, six, episode 15, 14, she's facing first the death penalty and she's facing fighting for her life. And she's sussing through how to dress for court. Let's play it. Guns or no guns. First day of trial. Risky showing skin. Or be you, powerful, fear of God. 
jurors are always gonna hate the guns. What do you tell clients? First day of trial, most important day of your life. Play the part or play no part. Be yourself. Why not just throw blood at everybody? Bougie, masculine, girly, power. Damn, this wig is good, pretty, safe. What they think a woman should look like. But my hair, real, me, raw, too raw. How can we still be having this conversation? It's just hair. But hair could decide it all. Jail or freedom. So wig? Screw them. Mm -hmm. She doesn't wear the wig. Joy, uh, you Ooh. actually watched this? What, yeah. This, what, what were your thoughts? Um, so Viola Davis and um, um, lawyer Miss Keating, as I like to call her, because she deserves the miss in front of her name. Um, I watched that show and didn't realize how much um, I would have to face as soon as I, you know, walked into the doors of 200 West Street, which are the, uh, which is the headquarters of Goldman Sachs. And so um, I think what's important about that clip and what um, Harriet mentioned as well is code switching is not exclusive to language or lexicon, but it's our entire um, existence and representation in a workplace. So um, let's go maybe flashback to July, 2017. I'm, I'm 5'8", so when I wear like, you know, I guess corporate heels, I'm, I kind of stick out like a sore thumb and I smile at everyone. So I'm like walking around like Goldman Sachs, like, yeah, I made it. And immediately it's like, I get this, this wave of, okay, I'm different. And so you kind of, you know, you brush it off because you want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And very quickly, as I, you know, started working, I started getting the, the comments of, you know, from a, a, a VP, oh, you know, I don't understand why you don't use your black voice. Like, you know, you talk with this weird, like, Americanized thing. And if you're Nigerian, why don't you just speak in your Nigerian? And you can kind of finish what the rest of that was. Or um, the fact that, you know, my colleagues or the other analysts, you know, are, of, you know, to be completely honest, are white females and they're walking around with itty bitty skirts that if I were still in Catholic school, you get the, the ruler to your knee if you're walking around like that. And I'm wearing, again, tall tailored clothing and I get pulled aside because, oh, you know, you're dressing a little too distracting for the workplace. You know, you should just consider wearing pants in the work environment. Don't get me wrong. I love a power suit. You know, I love all of that, but let's just keep that in mind. And I think the tipping point of all of those slight and overt microaggressions was I was presenting my work and I'm very careful about the pronunciation of my words. Um, and I say a word and the analyst that I'm working with cuts me off in the middle of the presentation and says, you mispronounced that wrong. And then they have a chuckle and then they go on about talking about the same idea that I was originally talking about and he got the credit and in my mind I kept thinking when I heard these stories like oh if I was in that position I would do this or that would never happen to me or you know why didn't you stand up for yourself and it's so different where all you want is for people to like you in a place where you are the other where you don't see a lot of people who look like you and two because you know I'm a, somewhat of an overachiever I'm just trying to get ahead and if I have to work 110 times harder than the co-analyst who's white and then also have to deal with the fact that he is taking ideas from me and claiming that I'm mispronouncing words. And then when we go out for analyst happy hours, he's like, oh, Joy's my favorite Oreo that I've ever met. Like, I, I just, I don't understand how those microaggressions are still a thing. And this was 2017, 2018. And so um, the clip, that we play from how to get away with murder, that is, or that was my reality. Um, once I got promoted at Goldman, I'd wake up and I'd pick certain clothes depending on the certain senior people that I was meeting that day or make sure I did my hair a certain way that just looked the most conservative as possible. And that was my life. And I thought that was going to be the thing until, and I'd be happy to talk about this more. I think going to China was really where mm. I was able to um, confront my own issues with code switching, um, my own issues with identity, and then find a happy medium of what I felt comfortable 
of what is presenting the best joy and yuga to the table while also, you know, exhibiting that relatability that code switching does allow for people like us, like brown bodies like us. I think, I think we're all, as young people, not that I'm young, but being a young person when you're young, you're always trying to find what, what your purpose is, why you're here, who you are, right? But being Black adds so much more to the equation, Harriet. You know, as she's talking, I'm thinking about how much time is spent on, is my hair right? Um, I had a, a young lady that was now working, that's now working for me, was going up for a job. She went to the beach the week before and she was like, I'm too dark to go to this interview. Mm. Am I too dark to go to this interview? Hair, am I too tall? Am I too strong? You know, are my arms too muscular? Is it, you know, too much skin? No, you know, all of that that Viola Davis's character went through, yeah. that internal conversation, how, how, negatively impactful is it to people's progress? Oh man, it, we beat ourselves up because we live in a culture that practices institutional racism. I mean, that just is true. And it's so ingrained. You know, when, when I talk to people right now, you know, in the era of COVID, the era of the murder of George Floyd, when people are talking about this more than ever before because it includes white people talking to each other and to black people about things that just weren't discussed. And, and so we're in an interesting moment, I think, but what, what, when you stopped joy and didn't even know what to say, it's, it's in part because you can't believe somebody would say something like that to you. It was actually absurd. And you kind of yeah. want to give people the benefit of the doubt that, oh, it's the 21st century and people are educated. But, you know, it's not always the case. And, and that these terms, you know, like code switching, microaggression, if you take a poll right now, people don't know what microaggression <laughs> means. I've been working with a company right now on some racial sensitivity training. And I'm telling you, I, every day we're defining what does microaggression mean be, it, from let me touch your hair invade your space and touch you who does that you know who thinks that is okay to do let me talk about you in such a way interrupt you when you're speaking as was done to you joy why partly intimidation partly because people think they can and when i say that it, it's actually not a thought it, i believe it's in part somewhere mm. in the dna even the most well-meaning people sometimes do not realize yeah. that they're stepping on top of others. And so they have to be called on it. And what mm -hmm. I like to help people understand, especially the white folks in the room, if you hear something that is off, be an say ally, something. say yes. something. Don't just, don't tell your colleague later, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. Speak up and say, no, that wasn't cool. Even if it's your boss, if you say something, then, that person doesn't have to go through the angst that you just described. And, and, and one thing that I teach, particularly at Hunter, as, as um, President Rabb said, I've been teaching many students about presentation, literally what we're talking about, how to present yourself professionally so that you can get where you wanna go. And Hunter has more than 100 countries represented in its student body. And the, the students will tell you, I tell them, find what is authentic about you, what is unique about you. you and, and usually that includes your cultural heritage. Own that, embrace that, share that. And what I can tell you is most students are really reluctant to do so. Yeah. They, they want to blend in. Well, you can't really blend in if you're brown, for starters. And brown covers a whole lot of people in the world. Let's say most people in the world but why not own it instead? Now, as it relates to accents, because I want to go back to that for a second, I do coach people on slowing down. You don't have to lose your accent, but if you have a heavy accent, speak slowly enough and clearly enough so that people can understand what you're saying. They, so you can speak what my daddy taught me was commercial English, because you want to make money in this world. That's not becoming white. Right. That's becoming commercially literate, which is a different thing that, that, and it is code switching, but everybody wants that code. Everybody does that. Everybody, right. white Absolutely. folks want that code too. You want the code that says I can make some money. 
doing what it is that I want to do. And people have to understand what you are saying in order for it to be, for you to have ease with making money, but bring your whole self to the table. How do you get young people in particular? And, and many of the kids that were in the room uh, when we had this discussion in the breakout were from immigrant families mm -hmm. who were taught much, much like joy because you know the South Bronx will limit you on so many levels. And what Harriet Cole is saying right now is so powerful because it's not about losing who you are. It is about oh. being able to make money and communicate effectively. You showing up wearing you know, your hair a certain way. If you love the way your hair is, then wear it. But if right. it's, if it's doing, if you're doing it only to make yourself blend in, as Harry said, you're never going to blend in. Mm -hmm. So now you, you're at a crossroads, right? What is it that you're actually going to do in terms of showing up in the workplace? And, and Joy, you've had an epiphany. Tell us a little bit about China, because I've had several of my friends who've lived in China and been to China and they don't see many oh, black people in China. Yeah. So you are, you are like Serena Williams or Michelle Obama or Oprah. I got Rihanna yes. sometimes oh, and I'll China. take it because I love Rihanna. But um, I guess to answer your question, um, it actually started a little bit prior to me leaving for China where I'd already told everyone at work that, you know, you know, I'm a Schwarzman scholar, you know, I'm leaving for China. And it's like, oh yeah, cool. And so I guess I became slightly, or not slightly, egregiously more unapologetic. And so sometimes, you know, my Because you were leaving. Because you were leaving. Because I was leaving. Because okay. I was leaving. <laughs> and so sometimes, you know, naturally, if my parents call me, um, they speak in like a, a kind of a symbiotic balance of English and Yoruba. So it, it's like a mix. And naturally, like if I'm speaking to my parents, I just... In, like inadvertently just switch into an, either an accent or I'm speaking in my language. Right. And so usually I'd like leave the building. Like I'd walk across the wow. street to take those calls with my parents. Two months before I left, I'm taking them in the hallway. I'm saying hi to people. It's like, I want you to see this element of myself that I frustratingly was hiding from you for the first 18 months of my career here. And so when I got to China, I think it, it's a double, it's a, it's a dual element because I was in a program where it was predominantly students of incredible privilege and wealth mm -hmm. who had attended predominantly white institutions, Ivy League schools. And that's not only in America. I'm thinking Oxford, you know, uh, all the, you know, prestigious universities globally. Um, and then in my cohort, there were 16 black students, black and African um, representing students, which is the most that Schwarzman scholars has seen. Um, and me, I'm representing not only female, but Black, but Nigerian American, right. but American, and a global kind of, you know, contributor in the schema of Schwarzman scholars. And so that was one thing. And then as soon as I stepped outside of the building, outside of campus, it was people just touch, tug, yeah saying and you know i again because i i i was trying to i was very weary about the language barrier i started taking chinese early and enough to know when people are insulting me so very commonly i'm walking in beijing and you know i don't want to judge but they're saying they're slinging like racially charged insults mm -hmm. and i can understand and then i'm thinking in my head i know what to respond back in mandarin to kind of you know tell them like hey i understand what you're saying but I'm representing more than just myself. I'm representing an entire race of people that they've never even encountered before. And so that was like a huge dilemma for me for the first couple months. You can ask, um, ask many people that I, you know, who are on the call, who are, you know, part of the program that I did, but I was really saddened and it was, you know, kind of a, a really tough time the first couple weeks being in China because I felt constricted. I'm in a college where like, everyone is a, this incredible privilege and wealth and talking to them about real world global issues as what we're supposed to do as Schwarzman scholars and they're not getting it. And then the minute I leave the campus, it's like people invading your personal space and saying, you know, things in the language that you're just trying to get your grasp on. And I couldn't find a home. And it, it, it makes me a little more emotional now just thinking about it, but I'm so grateful for that experience that I had. Um, so I, I couldn't complete the full year in China because of the COVID situation. So I came back in January, but this, you know, five or six months that I was there, 
it completely solidified who I see myself as Joy Nuga, what I want people to, you know, pick up within the first five to 10 minutes of meeting me and what I feel comfortable, you know, code switching into um, to make you feel comfortable with me, but to make me feel comfortable with myself. And mm -hmm. I thought I had mastered it at Goldman, just given that's, you know, a corporate predominantly white environment. But when you're in a country where there are some people who have yet to ever meet a black or brown right. person, it's exponentially more grand. And so I, I'm hoping that the time that I spent in China prepared me for, you know, the future career that I hope to um, pursue because that was like baptism by fire for me in terms of code switching. Mm. Now, now mm. I want to share something um, yes. that happens here. And again, I've been working with a bunch of people right now. So I've got some market research <laughs> that is very interesting. There are so many white people in America who have rarely been in contact with black people outside of the workplace who grew up in predominantly white, in, in entirely white neighborhoods, went to entirely white schools. And now we're in New York, work in New York, and the great eye opener is coming to New York and being in, in a work environment where there are some black people. And so I've been talking to some of them. And until this moment, literally, until the COVID George Floyd pause, reflect, and have it in your face, you have to figure it out and talk about it. Many of these people are telling me, I just didn't think about this. I didn't think about, I didn't think about black people at all. Not, and they're not being rude. Right. They're just and telling the truth. Right. That, that, that right. It, this is new. And because it's new, there, and and if, if their whole experience has been just being, a, there's an assumption that the world is mine. Or if there are challenges, you know, they, they don't have anything to do with race. And yet there are beliefs about other people based upon whatever you see in the media, whatever, whatever somebody has told you, especially if you, so it's very similar to what you're describing in China. Many people in this country well-meaning people, not, not overt racist in any way, are so limited in their right. access and, and interaction with people of other backgrounds, particularly black and brown people, that this is a new experience. Right. Well, and then, oh, sorry. No, 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 I was just going to say, but it's been codified, right, in our right, media. Right. What we export, we export in our music. And it's not who's controlling that. We're not controlling the exportation or birth of a nation, for example. So if the only movies you get show black people, you know, as drug dealers and as whores, as you know, and it, that's the only thing we export, and that's what is really popular. So when a black person shows up in the body of Joy Nuga, that's what they think. We're the worst of that's us, right. right? And it's right. the systemic racism that you, that is it permeated every cor corpus of this country. There was a um, study done in 2015, Washington Post did a survey. Three fourths of white Americans have never had a relationship with a black person. Three fourths. That's so, so and that's, right. that's willful though, but that's you segregate because <laughs> you can't. So you don't have to ever deal with the talk or what we're talking about today until George Floyd and we're trapped in our homes in eight minutes and 46 seconds, you had to literally watch a man die. Over to, and over, over and over again, again. To understand something different is going on here. Go ahead, Joy, I'm sorry. And then, no, and then, you know, that kind of triggers um, just a few months ago when the onset of like the George Floyd kind of domino effect where we started actually talking about race relations where for the three fourths of Americans that have never had a relationship with a black person, or you know, some of my former work colleagues, my colleagues now, my academic colleagues, and this is not to judge them in any way because to Harriet's point, they just haven't had you know the access to it. And one could argue, well, maybe they didn't seek that access, but nevertheless, I digress. There was the element of a added gravitas as, oh, I'm gonna look for a black person to help. I wanna hear your thoughts on George Floyd. I want you to explain microaggressions. Right. What is it like being black, Joy? <laughs> Describe colorism because you know, Joy, you look like this, but like I know another person who looks like this, but the people who are, you know, 
you know, the recipients of br police brutality most often look like this. Listen, for a long time, I thought I was almost in no place to speak on this because my experience as a Black person is vastly different from yours and from yours. I felt like it was a disservice to speak on Black issues broadly, especially in a corporate environment, because again, you are representing a larger group because I grew up in the South Bronx. I grew up to parents of immigrants. That's a whole kind of inherent difference to those Black Americans who grew up with you know, ancestry based in the United States as a result of slavery. I didn't think it was my position to even speak on these things. But as you mentioned earlier, it's become my, it's come to my attention and it's become my passion now to speak from my vantage point. Because if I can have someone understand what it's like to be me waking up and having to think about the things that I know my white friends never have to think about on a day-to-day -day basis. If that now, is imparted to them, then it's, it, I'm doing something. So Joy, um... And Karen, one of the things that I am uh, challenging people to do, all of us, is to go back and dig up our whole family history, particularly mm. talking to white people. If you know your story, then you have a different kind of story to tell. You may not want to know your whole story. See, part of the challenge in America is if so many Black people can trace their family back to slavery and then it stops there, that means so many white people can too. Slavery wasn't right. one-sided, it happened on both sides. So, but, but many white people do not want to face that. I've heard many very well-meaning white mm -hmm. folks say, I have nothing to do with that. That was, that was in the past, but we are all products that include our history. If we all learn our history, take the scab off the stuff we don't wanna know about, learn enough stories and then we talk to each other and tell the truth and cry the tears that are necessary for forgiveness and for learning, then we have a chance at creating something different. And what I tell black folks all the time, whether you want to or not, you are an educator. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should have to be the one to represent every black person because that's not fair anyway. Mm -hmm. But I, the survival, back to the, what we're talking about here, the theme of this, this um, discussion, part of survival and the even chance to thrive, I believe has to do with education. And what Viola was on there doing is, was, you know, is survival and, th between survive and thrive mm -hmm. at this pivotal point in her life, am I gonna wear my natural hair? Am I gonna put mm -hmm. in this wig that tells me something different? Am I going to show my buff arms? You know, what am I going to show in order to be authentically me, be powerful and be free? Well, part right. of that also was me showing up authentically. I'm also teaching people how to, so if we are all code switching all the time. Yes. And black is not monolithic. So you don't get to know that. So there are right. corporate, corporately educated blacks that know how right. to show up and comport themselves a certain way. And then there's the rap, you know, hip hop people, and there's nothing in between. Right. And you know, what I've tried to do my entire career, because I grew up in a household with a father who was not as strict as yours, Harriet, <laughs> but he wore a suit everywhere. And I tell this story all the time, even honey. to cookouts. Even oh. cookout, my mother would lose her mind in the summertime because he said, this is my bulletproof vest. He loves if I ever get pulled over, <laughs> I want a suit but and see, tie, which tells people that I'm not that. And so right. even among us, there are the brown paper bag tests and all of the things that we have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. brought into our own culture, the skin bleaching that we brought into our own culture to try to not just survive, but thrive in this racist system. I mean, by the way, sadly, in your home country, your parents' home country, Joy, skin bleaching in Nigeria and, and, and yeah. Ghana, I mean, it, it's, it's pervasive. It's pervasive. In China too, in China. oh my goodness. Like, it's, it's funny that you mentioned the suit being the bulletproof vest because yes. I swear if I'm ever in a position where I'm blessed in the future, I'm starting a, a menswear line inspired by my father because um, anyone who knows a Nigerian, the cultural garb is called Agbada. He rather wear a suit than wear what he was used to um, wearing growing up because again, he feels like people 
you know, when he roams the streets of New York, respect him more and don't give him the, the weary look um, when he's wearing a suit as opposed to when he's not. And um, to Cam's point, I think in addition to, you know, the clip where we saw with um, Viola, where she's, you know, equivocating about how to present herself, I think to those who choose to code switch and then turn back off, maybe turn off the code truth and just show their their full kind of black identity, I give kudos to you. It's something I'm actively trying to do because I think in order to educate, we need to, uh, it's a matter of exposure, having it become more familiar because what we're seeing often the case is that black culture and African culture is being appropriated by, you know, white bodies and they're, you know, making commercial gains off of it and it's on the cover of Vogue. But then when I want to wear my kente cloth, it's like, oh, but like, it's, it doesn't match my aesthetic joy. And it's like, okay, so why is it okay when X Kardashian wears it or wears, you know, cornrows, but then when I want to do X, Y, and Z, it's not. So I think in light of code switching, I think, and this is kind of, you know, a task for me, but it's to bring more of my Nigerian background, more of my South Bronx background, so that it is more familiar to people and they do feel more comfortable. So it isn't, so in the future, the people, you know, who come from similar backgrounds such as myself don't have to code switch as a means of survival. See, see I think this is about storytelling. And, you know, Karen, obviously that's what you've been doing for your whole career, telling stories, knowing our stories, mm -hmm. being able to tell them so vividly that people can see what we have experienced helps to open people's eyes. What you know, have in common. yeah, it shows what we have in common. It shows how, why we make certain decisions, why we have certain thoughts, why we have certain thoughts about something that you may say or do, you know, that, that, and, and, and I want to tell you one story that, that I, that is true about me. So my name, Harriet, old lady's name. I was like, why did you give me this name? Seriously? So <laughs> as a little girl, it was not fun having this old lady's name. And when I was in elementary school, there was a commercial that said, Harriet, the Ajax cleanser shakes out white turns blue. It was the most popular commercial in the world. It was for a housewife who was cleaning up her house. And the kids one day chanted this at me as I mounted the steps to go into school. I was shy. I was gawky. I was so uncomfortable. In part, they were calling me a housekeeper. That's what it felt like. My grandmother, my mother's mother, was a housekeeper. She was a domestic worker until she was 93 years old. I loved her, but I wasn't proud of that part of our heritage. I didn't want to be called that. And I went home and I, I was upset. And my mother said, what's wrong with you? And I told her, and she said, dry your eyes and let me tell you about your name. And she said, number one, your name for your father, Harry Cole. My father, I told you, tall, dark-skinned man became the first black state senator in Maryland and later the first black judge on the Maryland Court of Appeals. She says, you were named for him. But then she said, on my side, you were also named for your great-great-grandmother, Harriet Ann. You know how much I love that name back then. Her, that was her name. We have her manumission papers. She was freed in 1850. And as a white-skinned black woman, she raised the money and walked from Calvert County, Maryland, where Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman lived, they were alive at around the same time, to, to Annapolis, Maryland, to buy her husband and children who were being sold on the auction block before they were sold off. And my mother said, the next time somebody says something to you about your name, you better learn to live up to your name. Mm. Amazing story, right? Powerful. This, what's in a name? What's in who we are? If right. we know our stories, then we can share our stories and open people's eyes. And this is why code switching, yes, we have to do this, but we also need to walk with, the cloak should be our stories. Right. And we can, we, you know, we can share a story with this one and share a story with that one. And the more that we share about who we are, whatever our stories are, the more power we can assume because our stories can protect us. That is, that is so powerful. Right. And as Joy, we have to get some questions in because people want to talk to y'all. Harry right. Cole with an E at the end, named for <laughs> a woman that could buy the freedom of her family Hello. and her daddy 
and Joy Nuga, as we, as we start to talk about the questions, what Joy is saying, showing up authentically with your um, corporate English, but your South Bronx and your Nigerian allows for people to learn about us and also it not be such a weird thing like showing up in China with black skin. You know, right. it's not so weird if, if we start to keep telling people who we are and do right. so proudly instead of blending in and making them comfortable. They should be, a little discomfort is good. That's where the growth happens, right? All right, Definitely. we're going to bring in some questions. I think Mac is going to jump in and talk to us about who has questions. Hey, Mac. Hey, Ken. Hey, everybody. So, yes, we do have some good questions that have come in throughout the conversation, and I'll share some of those with you now. The first one from Elliot David. Elliot asks, what's the difference in code switching between Goldman Sachs or in China and a more diverse place like Hunter College? Obviously, this is for you, Joy. Mm. Um, so I have to give a shout out to Elliot David. He was um, part of my Schwarzman Scholars class this year. So congrats to him for also graduating. Um, but I think, wow, that is a loaded question. Code switching at Goldman Sachs. So um, if you couldn't tell, this is my normal um, affect. This is how I speak normally. I guess this is my default. It fluctuates depending again on who I'm speaking to. I'm, you know, on the topic of code switching. But at Goldman, I was so careful about what I said. I almost spoke so slowly that my manager at one point pulled me aside and was like, Joy, I know you're not nervous because there's no quivering in your voice but you're speaking so slowly and i just had to tell him it was because your my co-worker you know called me out for mispronouncing a word that i know i didn't mispronounce and so that was one element you know having people you know not you know write me off in the in a corporate you know setting as a result of something i said because i knew there were so many other things that i can control um one being my skin color um and, and Mac, what's the second question um, at Hunter College? Yeah. So code switching at Hunter College. I think this is probably like a more fun version of code switching because, and this is to the benefit of Hunter College being the most diverse place I have ever been to. I am jealous that the world is not a reflection of Hunter College yeah. East 60, did I get it? 68th Street? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I still remember it. <laughs> um, and it's sad because with, you know, a student body of over, what, 23,000, 24,000 students, I have never met people from every walk of life, socioeconomically, culturally, age, than I did at Hunter College. So yeah. I think the element of code switching there was a sense of um, switching to, for the sake of making people feel uncomfortable and included, as opposed to a survival mechanism so that people don't write me off. So I think that's the difference in code switching at Goldman than at Hunter College. Awesome. And here's a question from Peggy Siegel. She asks, what environments, and this is for everybody, what environments have you been in that have not demanded code switching? Environments where you could succeed without code switching? <laughs> are there any mm, well i'll speak up I, I can't okay so i host a radio show where i am authentically myself every yes. day and you know at first you, you you don't know if the audience is going to appreciate that but i knew that i absolutely could not do this radio show as somebody else i wasn't going to do radio this was going to ride on the success of me being authentic and delivering this content every day and Luckily, people seem to like what I do. They don't always like me, but as I say, you don't have to like me, but get this food. Chew up the meat, spit out the bones. You don't have to like every, who likes it? Who agrees with everybody? Who likes everybody? And that's really, you know, once I got in my mind, 10% of the people are going to hate you no matter what you say. 10% of the people are going to love you no matter what you say. It's the 80%, you know, so you just drown out that and just talk to people. And guess what? You know, over time, people start to gravitate towards it. So I very rarely code switch if at all. I don't actually. Yeah, that's, it's, that's a really good point, Karen. And I think, you know, I've been on my own working for myself for most of my career. And so I choose where I'm going to be and with whom I'm going to be. And I do think that I am authentically myself. Yes. When, I, when I made this statement, um, are there any environments where you can't be? I guess it's more like, you know, when you go to work in certain environments, you might wear a suit. 
In other environments, you might be able to wear more casual clothes. It doesn't change, to me, it doesn't change who you are if you need to change your clothes. Uh, but that is symbolic of code switching in a sense. Like if, if really what you just wanna do is roll out of bed and be comfortable, which some people do uh, on our Zoom calls <laughs> without apology, no matter what it is. You know, I do believe that presentation is important and I think it's important to know what is expected where you're headed so that you can prepare yourself for how you want to show up. And I don't think that means you have to be someone other than yourself, but it may mean that there, there's certain skills that you have developed that in your toolkit, you're going to pull out certain ones in certain moments. Yeah. Versatility. Matt, Versatility. Yeah, let's hit Joy, because Joy has to, she is very busy. She's got another, another thing after this. Understood. Um, here's a question from Sheena Rock. How do you differentiate code switching from respectability politics? Mm, that's a great question. I think there's a benchmark there. And um, I, I, I'm going to answer this from my perspective, because again, um, being a Schwarzman scholar and being in a cohort of students from over 100 countries, this was very much um, instructed and in, um, inculcated to us at the beginning of the program where it's called cultural humility. And I guess it kind of is in somewhat synonymous with them. Um, what was the term, Mac? Uh, respectability, 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 politics. respectability politics, where, you know, just given where we are, um, where we were studying um, China, which is a very different socio-political system there, um, which some may agree or disagree with, and then you have a cohort of people from all these countries where at the UN they're fighting, but as a cohort, we're, we're classmates. And so I think there's a certain benchmark of ensuring that you do your own research. And I think this is a responsibility and an accountability factor. You do your own research to make sure and ensure that you're not saying the, something that might be perceived as a microaggression, that you're not making someone feel overtly uncomfortable because that's what I did even as a black person to make sure that I wasn't doing that to another culture. So there's that. And then I think code switching is, is entirely different. I think depending on the context by which you're code switching, you're either doing it um, to um, serve as a relatability factor, which I guess kind of plays into the cultural humility, using that as a bridge of relatability between two people from vastly different cultures and identities. But in the context that, you know, I'm, pleased and honored to be sharing with Karen and Harriet is our lives have been somewhat of a testament of having to use code switching for means of survival because the the spaces that we've roamed have not allowed us to just be you know authentically black or authentically x whatever you want to um, you know attribute it as so I think there's a difference um, and there's a kind of a, a benchmark there but I'd love to hear the so Harriet. I, I want to add so I've had the unique experience of either working primarily for black people or for myself. So it's been, and I went to Howard University. So it, it's been very, I haven't had the experiences like what you described personally, Joy. I worked at Essence and one of the things that we did was to kind of translate for black women what it meant to wear your, if you're gonna wear your hair natural, then maybe you have that, this was in the early nineties, then you have a little bit more shoulder pads. So you can show I'm fierce, and I have natural hair. You know, you, how, how to balance it out so you could be in corporate America, be fiercely you, but also understand what the, what the rules of the road were. Mm -hmm. So I've always been in this space of trying to figure out how can you be authentically you and reach the top. Um, it's, I don't think it's easy for, for most people. I think occasionally, like what you described, Karen, have navigating to the point where you figure I got my radio show, boom. And people mm -hmm. go, I love you being you. That sense though, I really think is what, when we win, truly win, it's because we get into that lane mm -hmm. of being truly us. Mm -hmm. Like you can't, people don't really hire folks at Goldman Sachs and other black people to be white. Why right. would they do that? They really kind of want you to be something that's true to you and true to what clients you can bring in. But you have, to, you have to get to the point of exercising the muscle 
that says, yeah, I think you, I think you need me. And here's what you need. Yes. Boom. And then you're, here's your story. You need this. You need this. You need this. Yeah. And this, right. and this audience, this whatever base that I represent because I'm being me. Mm. When, when I was invited to sit on the editorial board at the Daily News, they already had a black person there. So I was curious and I'm like, you already have a black person, there are only seven members on the board. And at the time, Michael Goodwin, shout out to him, said, no, but you covered business, you covered sports, you have a unique role. I wanna to put together a board that can be brought. And in that moment, I realized he, under, he gets diversity because mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. skin color. And if more people understood right. diversity is not skin color. It's right. what you uniquely bring to the table. And we all have a fingerprint of something that we bring to the table and more corporate spaces understood that walking in the door from the South Bronx with Nigerian parents with all of the, all of the scholarship gives us something, gives us an advantage. Yeah. Then we wouldn't see a 2% diversity problem in tech and all these, because you're losing. Right. And not many people can show up like a Bill Gates, excuse me, not Bill Gates, Zuckerberg with the, with the horrible mock turtle or Steve Jobs, <laughs> rest his soul, you know, with the same mom jeans on and, you know, and be successful and be a billionaire, right? That's not right, everyone right. can do that. Right. But they had unique talents that allowed them to be themselves. And I think part of this journey is also finding your unique talent that That's no one else can take right. from you. So you got to run? Yeah, but I'll close with one. I'm so, so, so blessed and honored that I got to share um, a Zoom screen with you, Harriet, and with you, Karen. And I'll say that, you know, while I was a participant on this panel, I'm still learning. I'm learning from the experiences of you both and the other, especially Black women that have, you know, proceeded in the spaces that I hope to be in. And if anything, I'm using this as a, you know, a covenant that in the next role, professional space that I exhibit in, I will try to be more of the, the Karen, like you will see me, you will accept me in all that I am. And, you know, hopefully read up on all the etiquette things that Harriet has also published work on. So once again, I'm so grateful and, and thank you both. It's great to Boy, meet you. You already got it, sis, you already got <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. Thank you so much and thank stay you. in touch because this, right. is, this is a community, this is a family. That's right. And thank you for being here, Joy Nuga. Follow her everywhere. She's going to the top. Uh, Matt, I, I want to add this to Harry when it, Matt sure. asked a question about respectability politics. You know, I liken it to like, I have a home. If you come in my home, there's a bag of, there's a uh, basket of socks. You're gonna have to take off your shoes. You, you're, you're gonna, you know, they're coasters. You're not gonna put your drink down on my <laughs> furniture. You know, this is etiquette. There's home training, right? Yes. Coast switching is not about home training. It's literally no. about culturally folding yourself into a tiny box, diminishing everything about you that makes you unique so that the space that you're in won't see you, won't target you, they'll hire you. You know, when I showed up for my interview, I had on the stockings, back in the day wore stockings and slips yeah. and my hair was pressed and I, you know, spoke corporate English, which I, I struggle with to this day, just because it's so much fun to not do it. <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, I, I argue that's not our native tongue. So I can do whatever I want with it. How to be, you, you actually have a book with that title. I do. So, so you know what, I, and, and I, will, I will say, Karen, when I have thought of code switching, I haven't thought that it's only that extreme. So I'm glad to, what, and that's why definitions are important. I mean, I think sometimes it's very strategic. Uh, it can be using commercial English in one moment and using vernacular in the next, just so you make it clear. I can do that. And this, but this is what I do. Being strategic, I think, is important to be able to be that. Mm -hmm. Folding yourself up into something that is not you, I do not consider acceptable. So I'm glad that we took this far enough. That this is why it's so important to articulate definitions for things. I think sometimes code switching can be fun because it's like, oh. You got that too? You know how to do that too? Can, and, and, and can, can that person come and, and code switch with you? When you go into your environment, take, let me take you to whatever my environment is and can you do that with me? But the folding oneself up and, and crushing spirit is unacceptable. 
And I'm hoping that when people walk away from this session, that they will understand there's a range of opportunity for us in the ways in which we communicate, but never should we allow ourselves to, to destroy who we are and to, to hurt our spirit and our soul. Because we're not just doing a disservice to ourselves. We're actually doing a disservice to the world that we live in. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I look at us as a billion puzzle pieces that have exploded. And your little piece has to fit in into just your unique little space in order to make the full picture as humanity. Yes. And as long as we don't see ourselves that way, if there's this homogenous kind of, well, we all are blended into this melting pot. No, it's not a melting pot. What if you had a puzzle with a billion pieces and they were all the same, the same color, everything was the same. I mean, there are puzzles like that, but who does them? That is so boring. That is so yes. boring. We Isn't like it? the puzzle that has the different colors and the different moods and the different, you know, the curiosity of figuring out how they fit in and what they show you. Absolutely. When, what do we show each other when we offer our fullness? And going back to the Hunter College student, and you know, you're on this, this is, this is your, your college. I'm, I'm teaching a little bit here, but you've been here for a minute. Yes. The students, when they realize that we value their personal narrative, that we want to know who they are, that we care, that it matters who they are, their eyes get wide That's and right. they're like, really, Miss Cole? Are you serious? You really want to know? And, and when, when they start opening up and you can see you really do mean that you want to know about me and all, all of those from whom I come, they get stronger. And that is what I'm hoping people will understand. You just get stronger by fully embracing who you are. Who wouldn't want to be seen for those people who are hiring? Who wouldn't want to be seen? You know, and we're not monolithic and we're not stereotypes. And unfortunately, we live in a world of stereotypes and we live we in a do. world where people weren't raised properly. So the, you know, the rules of engagement are, are really strained right now. Um, but to, to have that, this kind of toxic environment on top of not having your soul to, to rely on oh. makes for a horrible world. Okay, Mac, you got any more questions? We got, we'll take two more and then we have to break off, I think. We're, yeah. actually, uh, we're actually out of, question, out of time for- Okay, uh, we're out of time. We, we've right. got to move on to the- uh, Breakout, breakout sessions. Here. All right. So I Misha, apologize. Yeah, Hi, Misha. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thank everybody. I want to thank everyone for this amazing discussion. This has been one of my favorites. Um, and we had so many students and faculty and staff participating. So thank you again to Karen. Thank you again to Harriet. Joy has gone off to do more fabulous things. Yes. Um, but we wanted to make sure to tell you all that we really appreciate this time and dedicating yourself to this work.